Well, I'm told that we're full of capacity, so we're not waiting on anyone. Um, my name is Stan Barrent. I'm chair of the Senate Assembly in SACUA, and I want to welcome you to the 14th Annual University of Michigan Senate's Davis Marker Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. Uh, first, it's my distinct pleasure to make a few brief remarks by way of introducing Peggy Hollingsworth, president of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund. Dr. Hollingsworth was instrumental in the creation of this lecture series. She became and continues as a driving force, leading to its present importance as a major scholarly event at our institution. A past national president of Sigma Xi, Peggy has accumulated an impressive list of honors and awards during her very successful career, including the prestigious University of Michigan Distinguished Faculty Governance Award in 1994. I now turn the program over to Peggy Hollingsworth. Uh, for those of you who think this should have been at Hill, Power, or other places, we agree. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were not available. Uh, we anticipated an uh, a excellent turnout for Professor Chomsky, and of course you're here. Uh, he told me when we were driving in today that um, uh, the only places that he does not like to, like to lecture are in uh, basket, on places where there are basketball courts. So hopefully this is a little bit better than a basketball court, but not as nice as would have been if I, we had had uh, proper seating for all of you. Uh, are you guys okay over there? You're not going to fall off and, and do something. All right. All right. Okay. Can you increase the volume back there? Can you increase the volume? How is it now? Is, is that better? Okay, more. All right, how is it now? Is it about the same? I don't control the volume from here. It's controlled from another source. All right. <laughs> this is the 14th year that I've had the opportunity to welcome you to the annual Davis Margaret Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. As you're aware, this lecture series was named in honor of three former University of Michigan faculty members who were treated badly by the University of Michigan during the McCarthy era. Professor Markert and Nickerson are no longer with us, but Professor H. Chandler Davis is here today. Chandler, will you please stand so we can welcome you? Chandler. history of the events that led up to the establishment of the lecture series is in your program. And more extensive and different treatments of the subject can be found in the book, Unfettered Expression, Freedom in American Intellectual Life, and in Adam E. Kulikow's video documentary, Keeping in Mind the McCarthy Era at the University of Michigan. Both are referenced in your program. The 1990s Senate Assembly resolution that created this lecture series states, quote, the protection of academic and intellectual freedoms requires a constant reminder of their value and vulnerability, end quote. The purpose of this lecture series is to help, help us to always keep in mind this critically wise council. Our annual lectures are chosen not because they support any political party or espouse any particular ideology, but because we believe that they help us to fulfill the purpose of the lecture series. All of our lecturers have been highly distinguished in their fields of interest, experience, and expertise, and have provided us with noteworthy presentations. The first three lecturers, Robert M. O'Neill, Lisey Bollinger, and Catherine R. Stimson, focused upon campus speech codes, the pros and cons of which were heatedly debated during the early 1990s. Subsequently, the topics addressed have been expanded and become more diversified. For example, David A. Hollinger in the ninth annual lecture and Ellen Schrecker at the 10th anniversary symposium spoke about the corporization 
of higher education. On September 11, 2001, Vartan Gregorian preceded his brilliant lecture with a thoughtful prognostication on the consequences of the terrorist attacks on New York and Washington that had taken place earlier that day. Last year, David A. Cole talked about academic freedom in the context of the United States Patriot Act. I know that everyone here is waiting with keen anticipation for Professor Noam Chomsky to share his thoughts with us today. I would also like to comment on the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, which is one of the sponsors of today's lecture. When the lecture series was established in 1990, neither the University of Michigan's administration nor its Board of Regents were supportive. It was not until former school, uh, law school dean, Lisey Bollinger, became the 12th president of the University of Michigan that his office, the Office of the President, became an official sponsor of the lecture series. Today, the fund, which has become an autonomous agency, works with administrative and academic units and faculty governance groups, as well as with the Ann Arbor chapter of the American Association of University Professors to raise funds to support events related to academic freedom. Currently, we are working closely with the university administration to establish a Davis Margaret Nickerson visiting professorship. It is through your contributions to the fund that this lecture series has survived, grown, and flourished. And your contributions will also be an essential part of any endowment that we might generate to support the professorship. It is my pleasure to inform you that Jeffrey S. Lehman, former dean of our law school and current president of Cornell University, has joined the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund's advisory board. In recent years, the law school has been a major supporter of the annual lecture and has not only provided the lecture rooms, but its administration and faculty have adjusted their classroom schedules to make certain that our lectures are successful and that its students will be able to attend. I would also like to express appreciation to many who work diligently behind the scenes each year to ensure the success of the lecture. Special mention must be made of the staff of the Faculty Senate Office, Jane Liu, Mary Mandeville, and Tom Schneider. I would also like to thank Brent J. Futrell, the graphic artist from the law school who has been responsible for the stunning design of the posters and programs for the lecture series in recent years. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of Patrick Murphy of Biomedical Communications and his colleagues, who for years have been responsible for the videotaping of the annual lecture. In addition, I would be remiss if I did not recognize the ongoing and significant contributions of my husband, Professor Charles B. Smith, to the fund and to the lecture series. I have been asked to inform you about two upcoming events that are either directly or indirectly related to Professor Chomsky. The first is at 7 p.m. this evening in Auditorium B of Angel Hall. The Department of History's Institute for Historical Studies is sponsoring a documentary film symposium, The Corporation. The second is a seminar on Friday at 2 p.m. in the Modern Languages Building, Auditorium 4, that is co-sponsored by the Departments of Linguistics, Philosophy, and Psychology. This seminar, presented by Professor Chomsky, is entitled Biolinguistics and Human Cognitive Capacities. Both the symposium and the lecture are free and open to the public. Additional information about these two events is available on tables outside the Honeyman Auditorium in Room 150. Finally, the members of the audience are asked not to videotape this lecture and not to take photographs for obvious reasons. Also, please turn off your telephones and pagers. Now I would like to ask Provost Paul Crunt to introduce the 2004 Davis Market Nickerson Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, I'm pleased to join you and uh, Stan Morand and, and faculty governance in welcome you to, welcoming you to the 14th Annual Davis Markert Nickerson Lecture. And I especially, again, want to extend my thanks to Dr. Davis for the courageous stand he took in 1954, a time that many of us remember. <laughs> He had the courage to challenge those who would limit our rights to think and to speak and to freely associate with people who hold nonconforming ideas. Those rights are at the heart of what this country is about and very much at the heart of what this university ought to be about and tragically was not in 1954. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the three honorees, the three people for whom this lecture is named. I know it's in your programs, but I'm guessing a lot of you don't have programs. Uh, and so if you'll forgive me for taking a moment to talk about Professor Davis and his colleagues, uh, in a moment I will uh, briefly summarize their circumstances. This lecture is an extremely important event on the university calendar. Uh, President Coleman introduced it last year. She couldn't be here this year. Uh, it's a time in which we, we think about academic and intellectual freedom. I want to quote a little bit more from the Senate Assembly's 1990 resolution. Um, the freedoms are, and I quote, fundamental values for a university and a free society. They form the foundation of the rights for free inquiry, free expression, and dissent that are necessary for the life of the university. Today's lecture also forces us to remember that these freedoms can be curtailed. Again, quoting from the Senate Assembly Resolution, these values and the rights they imply are vulnerable to the fads, fashions, social movements, and mass fears that threaten to still dissent and censure carriers of unpopular ideas. It is essential that we recall or learn about the university's own failure to protect these freedoms. In 1954, during what we now call the McCarthy era, three university faculty members, Chandler Davis, Clement Markert, and Mark Nickerson, were summoned to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Choosing to test the constitutionality of that committee, each of them refused to testify about their political activities. These were courageous acts at a difficult time, the university did not support them. Dr. Davis, a mathematician, was educated at Harvard and taught math here from 1950 to 1954. Because of his refusal to testify before the committee without invoking protection from self-incrimination, he was suspended from the university. His department, mathematics, and his college, LSNA, supported his reinstatement, but the faculty senate did not and he was dismissed from the university. That's not the same story for everybody. Dr. Davis was also cited for contempt of Congress, indicted in 1954, and convicted in 1957. He was unsuccessful in his appeals and served a federal prison sentence in 1960. Since 1962, he has been a member of the faculty at the University of Toronto. He's had a distinguished career in mathematics and also was a writer of science fiction. Currently, he's Professor Emeritus at the University of Toronto. Clement Markert, who passed away in 1999, had an impressive career as a biologist. After earning his PhD from Johns Hopkins, he began a faculty career here as assistant professor of, Do of zoology. Like Dr. Davis, he was summoned before the House on American Activities Committee, and he too refused to testify without invoking his Fifth Amendment rights. He was suspended by the university, but later re reinstated with the support of the biology department, LSA, and the faculty senate, and went on to receive tenure here. Dr. Marker later chaired the Department of Biology at Yale, was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and was president of the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Mark Nickerson, who died in 1998, made major contributions to the field of pharmacology, holding both a PhD from Johns Hopkins and an MD from the University of Utah. Dr. Nickerson was an associate professor with tenure when he was summoned to appear before the committee. Like his colleagues, he refused to respond to question. He was immediately suspended from the university. Although the faculty senate supported his reinstatement, his department in the medical school did not, uh, and he was dismissed despite having tenure. He went on to serve as professor of pharmacology and therapeutics at McGill University, chairing the department there. The author of more than 250 publications, he served as president of the Pharmacological Society of Canada and the American Society of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. These three men were scholars of great ability and men of great integrity. That they were scholars of great ability actually is irrelevant to the issue at hand. It turns out that they were. Their contributions took place in other places than the University of Michigan. They could have made great contributions here. They made them elsewhere. But you know what? They could have been third rate, and we still would have gotten this wrong. And I think that's a very important point to remember. We are among the many beneficiaries of their actions, and we have a deep responsibility to defend academic and intellectual freedom. Today's lecture is a recognition of that responsibility. 
Our scholarly life, our individual liberty, our democratic way of life rests on these freedoms. The Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, which supports this annual lecture, has an important quote from Justice Brandeis on its website. Taken from the 1927 case of Larkin versus State of California, it remains very much on point today. Justice Brandeis wrote, freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. Let me add that we need not restrict this to political truth. And we are honored today to have Dr. Noam Chomsky with us, who certainly is a speaker to political and other truth. He is, he is an academic and public intellectual, deeply interested in the pursuit of truth and our ability to speak as we think. He's a well-known scholar of linguistics, philosophy, and intellectual history. He's also known as a keen observer of international affairs and a thoughtful and outspoken critic of U.S. policy. And that goes back to the period when some of us who have gray hair did not. Dr. Chomsky's interests are extensive. He has written numerous books and articles on language, ideology, foreign policy, governance and government, democracy, education, terrorism, sound patterns, Middle East peace, and epistemology. Checking his blog, one finds 20 or more different topics addressed with clarity and passion. The awards Dr. Chomsky has received reflect the diversity of his work. In addition to honorary degrees from universities on four continents, he has received the Distinguished Contribution Award from the American Psychological Association, the Kyoto Prize in Basic Science, the Dorothy Eldridge Peace Award, and the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Computer and Cognitive Science. Dr. Chomsky received three degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and began his teaching career there. Since 1955, he has been on the faculty of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and currently holds the title of Institute Professor at MIT. His breadth of knowledge and deep commitment to search for truth speak tr and, and to speak truth to power make Dr. Chomsky a rightful descendant of Professors Davis, Margaret, and Nickerson. Please join me in welcoming him to the University of Michigan. My remarks today uh, will not bear directly on academic freedom, uh, but on two closely related matters. Uh, by comparative and historical standards, uh, academic freedom is reasonably well protected today in the United States, uh, perhaps almost uniquely so. Uh, freedom confers opportunity, and opportunity confers responsibility, that is, the responsibility to use the freedom one enjoys uh, wisely, honestly, and humanely. Uh, just what that entails, uh, we each have to decide for ourselves. Uh, I want to concentrate on one case, uh, which is uh, all agree of great significance, uh, quite literally reaching to uh, issues of uh, survival of the species and much else. Uh, that's the question of uh, the resort to force in international affairs and uh, to stress in an academic setting uh, how the legitimacy of the resort to force has been understood in the past, including the recent past, and how it's understood today. The uh, hideous crimes of the 20th century uh, led to dedicated efforts to save humans from the curse of war. Uh, and the word save is no exaggeration. Uh, surely, since it became clear in 1945 that the likelihood of uh, ultimate doom is well beyond what any rational person uh, should be willing to tolerate. Actually, the phrase ultimate doom is not mine. I'm borrowing it from two prominent strategic analysts writing in the current issue of the sober and uh, respectable journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, which is not given to hyperbole. They conclude that Washington's current military programs and aggressive stance and the predictable reaction to them 
carry, in their words, an appreciable risk of ultimate doom. And they express the hope that the threat will be countered by a coalition of peace-loving nations led by China. We've come to a pretty pass when such thoughts are expressed at the heart of the establishment. And what that implies about the state of American democracy, where the issues scarcely even enter the electoral arena, is no less shocking. Uh, the uh, efforts to end the curse of war led to a consensus on the principles that guide state action in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Formally, the consensus still remains. It's, however, very revealing and instructive to see how the spectrum of opinion has shifted, so much so that the post-war consensus has drifted to the extremist edge of public discussion and electoral politics. The post-war consensus is not usually rejected explicitly, though sometimes it is in quite revealing ways. Uh, rather, it's virtually ignored. Uh, considered too extremist to consider. The uh, virtual disappearance of the post-war consensus uh, actually took place rather recently in the latter part of the 1990s. Uh, the last years of the millennium were a remarkable moment of intellectual history. Hard to think of any precedent. Uh, across the spectrum of uh, articulate opinion, there was enthusiastic celebration, from now on its quotes, of a normative revolution in world affairs uh, with awed acclaim for the idealistic new world bent on ending inhumanity, which had entered a noble phase of its foreign policy with a saintly glow. For the first time in history, a state is dedicated to principles and values, acting from altruism and moral fervor alone as the leader of the enlightened states, uh, hence free to resort to force uh, for what the, its leaders determined to be right. Uh, that's a small sample of an extraordinary deluge I've been selecting only from the most respected liberal voices. Uh, after several years of such rhetorical flights, uh, two events were brought forth as uh, evidence for the impressive uh, exercise of self-adulation, uh, Kosovo and East Timor, it was, regard, it was with regard to Kosovo that the phrase illegal but legitimate was used in an unusual, uh, unusually sober and uh, careful evaluation of the bombing of Serbia. I'll return to it. Uh, in this atmosphere of self-adulation, uh, highly regarded legal scholars explained that the framework of international law that had been established after World War II is just hot air. I'm now quoting again. The grand attempt to subject the rule of force to the rule of law should be deposited in the Ashcan of history. The conclusive proof came a few years later, the same legal authority writes, when Washington made it clear that it intends to do all it can to maintain its preeminence that it would ignore the UN Security Council over Iraq uh, and would no longer be bound by the UN Charter's rules governing the laws of the use of force. Therefore, the rules have collapsed, and in the winter of 2003, that entire edifice came crashing down. A uh, good thing, he concludes, because the leader of the enlightened states must resist any effort to curb its use of force. Uh, again, I'm quoting from the liberal end of the spectrum of opinion, legal scholarship in this case, in the leading establishment journals and scholarly work. And these uh, declarations do encapsulate with clarity and honesty what have become in practice prevailing elite perceptions. Although it should be stressed, uh, they are not the perceptions of the general public. The divide between elite opinion and public opinion is extraordinary. Uh, a considerable majority of the public believe that the United States should accept the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and the World Court 
uh, that it should sign the Kyoto Protocols, that it should rely on the United Nations to take the lead in international crises, including issues of security, reconstruction, and political transition in Iraq. A uh, large a majority even believe that the United States should abandon the Security Council veto. It should rely on diplomatic and economic measures more than military ones in the so-called War on Terror, and it should use force only if, I'm quoting, there is strong evidence that the country is in imminent danger of being attacked. Uh, thus, the large majority of the public uh, reject the bipartisan consensus on what's called preemptive war. Uh, it's notable that these views and others like them are held by people in virtual isolation. They rarely hear them and probably regard them as idiosyncratic. Uh, these views do not enter into political campaigns. Uh, they enter only marginally into articulate opinion in media and journals. The same extends to other domains and again uh, raises questions about uh, a democratic deficit in our own country to adopt the phrase we use for others. Uh, the uh, efforts to spare the world the horrors of war received an expression in the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928, which sought to outlaw war, and they took a definitive form in the UN Charter, which opens by expressing the determination of the signatories to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind, and by then threatened not just untold sorrow, but total destruction, as all participants knew, uh, but also knew that they could not mention. Uh, the words atomic and nuclear do not appear in the Charter. Uh, in the United States, the Charter is part of the supreme law of the land. Its provisions were spelled out further in the Nuremberg Tribunal judgment, which declares that initiation of a war of aggression, use of force without authorization by the Charter, uh, is the supreme international crime differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole, including every crime that follows from it. Uh, those who, have, uh, who were judged at Nuremberg to have played any role in the supreme crime, uh, for example, the German foreign minister, uh, were sentenced to death by hanging the Tokyo Tribunal was uh, much more severe. Uh, uh, though the uh, principles enunciated were significant, uh, both of the tribunals were deeply flawed uh, by the most uh, elementary moral standards. Uh, their founding principles very explicitly rejected the principle of universality, the foundation of all moral judgment. That is the principle that we apply to ourselves the same standards we apply to others, and if we're serious, uh, even stricter ones. To bring the Nazi criminals to justice, it was necessary to devise definitions of war crime and crime against peace. Uh, how this was done is explained by the chief counsel for the prosecution, Telford Taylor, distinguished international lawyer and historian. Uh, he explains that uh, since both sides in World War II had played the terrible game of urban destruction, the Allies far more successfully, there was no basis for criminal charges against Germans or Japanese, and in fact, no such charges were brought. Uh, aerial bombardment had been used so extensively and ruthlessly on the Allied side as well as the Axis side that neither at Nuremberg nor Tokyo was the issue made a part of the trials. So the operative definition of crime is crime that you committed and we didn't. And uh, to underscore that fact, uh, Nazi war criminals were absolved at Nuremberg if the defense could show that their U.S. counterparts had carried out the same crimes. And Taylor explains, uh, to punish the foe, especially the vanquished foe, for conduct in which the enforcer nation has engaged would be so grossly inequitable as to discredit the laws themselves, which is quite 
correct, uh, but the operative definition of crime also discredits the laws themselves. Uh, every subsequent tribunal is discredited by the same deep moral flaw. So the Yugoslavia Criminal Tribunal, which is now underway, is a very striking example. A group of international lawyers requested the tribunal to investigate NATO crimes that were, this is the bombing of Serbia, uh, crimes that were recorded by the major international human rights organizations and other sources, uh, even admissions by the NATO command. The prosecutors rejected the request without investigation in violation of the statutes of the tribunal. The first prosecutor stated in the midst of the bombing that I accept the assurances given by NATO leaders that they intend to comply with international humanitarian law. Her successor uh, simply stated that NATO assurances left her very satisfied that there is no basis for opening an investigation of the NATO air campaign. That took care of that. Uh, Yugoslavia did bring charges to the world court uh, invoking the Genocide Convention. Now, those proceedings are actually underway right now, uh, but without the participation of the United States. Uh, the United States excluded itself on the grounds that when Washington finally signed the Genocide Convention after 40 years, it added a reservation excluding itself from charges, and the court correctly accepted this argument. Uh, much the same happened in the case brought by Nicaragua against the United States 20 years ago. A core part of Nicaragua's case, which was presented by a distinguished Harvard University law professor, was rejected by the court on the grounds that when the United States accepted world court jurisdiction in 1946, it had entered a reservation excluding itself from prosecution under any multilateral treaties, hence excluding the supreme crime of aggression. Uh, the court was therefore compelled to uh, restrict its deliberations to what's called customary international law and a marginal bilateral U.S.-Nicaragua treaty. Uh, even on these very narrow grounds, the court charged Washington with uh, unlawful use of force in lay language, that's international terrorism, uh, and ordered it to terminate the crime and pay substantial reparations. Those would incidentally go far beyond paying off the huge debt that is strangling Nicaragua. The uh, elite consensus dismissed the court as uh, what the New York Times editors called a hostile forum reflecting the prevailing view, hostile because they uh, uh, ju uh, made a decision against the United States. They weren't hostile when they supported the United States in earlier cases. Uh, and that was normal. Everyone almost reacted that way. Uh, the U.S. Uh, responded to the court judgment by escalating the terrorist war against Nicaragua and vetoing two Security Council resolutions uh, that affirmed the court judgment. Uh, virtually none of this was reported. Uh, the targeted country was virtually destroyed, and it sank uh, further into misery after the United States took over again in 1990 uh, with Americans united in joy over victory for U.S. fair play, as the New York Times uh, headlines exalted. By now, 60 percent of children under two suffer severe malnutrition and probable brain damage, now, that's a radical change from 20 years earlier when Washington was panicked by reports from uh, UNICEF, uh, the World Bank, and other international agencies about uh, what they called Nicaragua's remarkable achievements that were laying a solid foundation for long-term socioeconomic development uh, as the country enjoyed one of the most dramatic improvements in child survival in the developing world. Well, no fear of that now. So the elite press tells us we're united in joy over the victory for U.S. fair play. Uh, none of this was deemed worthy of attention when the wave of self-adulation crested a few years later uh, 
and when the perpetrators of the crime, those condemned by the court, were returned to office where they are right now. Uh, in the case of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the United States took no chances. Uh, Washington insisted that the tribunal exclude crimes against peace, the supreme crime of Nuremberg. The reason was explained by the American drafter. Uh, he said that uh, the U.S. did not want to establish precedents that might hamper U.S. military action, such as the invasion of Panama, which had been condemned by the UN General Assembly, but not the Security Council, thanks to the veto. Uh, well, rejection of the principle of universality is understandable. So just consider the consequences if we were willing to, uh, uh, to uh, even consider uh, elementary moral principles. So suppose uh, if the United States is granted what's called the right of anticipatory self-defense against terror, that's the elite consensus, then a fortiori, uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, and a host of others uh, have long been entitled to carry out terrorist acts within the United States because there is no doubt whatsoever of Washington's involvement in very serious terrorist attacks against them, extensively uh, documented in impeccable sources uh, and in the case of Nicaragua, even condemned by the World Court and the Security Council in resolutions that the U.S. vetoed. Uh, the conclusion, of course, is utterly outrageous and advocated by no one, but think through the logic. Uh, there are still more outrageous conclusions. Uh, no one, for example, would uh, argue that Japan exercised the right of anticipatory self-defense when it bombed military bases in the U.S. colonies of Hawaii and the Philippines in 1941, uh, even though the Japanese knew very well that B-17 flying fortresses were coming off the Boeing production line, and they were surely capable of reading the very public discussions in the United States explaining how these planes could be used to incinerate Japan's wooden cities in a war of extermination flying from Hawaiian and uh, Philippine bases. Uh, well, that's something the U.S. can't claim anywhere near it. Uh, nor would anyone accord the right of anticipatory self-defense to any state today apart from the self-declared enlightened states, which have the power to determine norms and to apply them selectively at will while basking in self-praise. So we conclude again that the principle of universality has a crucial exception and that rejection of elementary moral truisms is so deeply entrenched that even raising the question would be considered an unspeakable abomination. Well, all of that bears on the use of our freedom uh, and the responsibilities that it confers. Uh, let's return to the use of force. Uh, the UN Charter is quite explicit on when it is permitted, uh, namely if it's authorized by the Security Council or is undertaken in self-defense against armed attack until the Security Council acts. The latter concept is spelled out in the famous wording of Daniel Webster that response to armed attack is legitimate when the necessity for action is instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment of deliberation. Response under those conditions is preemptive war. Any other resort to force is the supreme international crime. Uh, well, domestic and international law are not uh, formal axiom systems, and there's some scope for interpretation, uh, but as far as human affairs are concerned, the meaning and the implications are quite clear. At the very least, uh, they set a standard by which any resort to force should be evaluated. I'll quote from the opening words of an important recent book by two specialists on these topics, Howard Friel and Richard Falk. Uh, International law presents clear and authoritative standards with respect to the use of force that should be followed by all states, <laughs> 
and if there is some departure under exceptional circumstances, a heavy burden of persuasion is on the state uh, claiming the exception. So very much as in the case of domestic law, any resort to force or violation of law carries a heavy burden of persuasion. Uh, just uh, to make my own standpoint clear, I basically agree with these conclusions, and I think they should be the conventional understanding. Uh, they are not, however, apart from the general population, uh, which does accept this stand, as I mentioned. In sharp contrast, uh, within articulate opinion, it receives virtually no expression. Uh, that's actually been true for a long time and has been amply documented going back many years. Uh, Friel and Falk uh, add to the documentation with a detailed analysis of what they call the persistent refusal of the New York Times to consider international law arguments opposing recourse to and conduct of war by American political leaders. Uh, the Times, they show, is vigorous in its denunciation of global adversaries of the United States who contemplate aggressive wars or engage in hostile acts against American citizens in violation of international law, uh, but ignores such matters in the case of U.S. actions. As one of many current illustrations, they point out that the words U.N. Charter uh, or international law never appeared in any of the 70 editorials leading up to the invasion of Iraq, and they show that the practice is virtually uniform in opinion columns and many other cases. Now, they select the New York Times only because of its unusual importance, and as many other studies show, it's typical in those respects and has been uh, throughout the period since the current framework of international law was established in the Charter and the Tribunal judgments. Well, that's one point of view, that international law should be our standard. At the opposite extreme is the position that the United States has the unilateral right to resort to force when it chooses to do so. It's the position of the Bush administration, which was formulated in the national security strategy of September 2002, but uh, worth remembering that it was expressed clearly enough uh, before 9-11. That is not the triggering event. Uh, so in an article that appeared in Foreign Affairs, actually even before the election, Condoleezza Rice condemned what she called the reflexive appeal to notions of international law and norms and the belief that the support of many states or even better of institutions like the United Nations is essential to the legitimate exercise of power uh, by the United States, of course, uh, the usual exception prevails. Uh, this uh, extremist position is in fact conventional. Uh, there are illustrations from every point of the political spectrum. So just uh, far to the left liberal end, the elder statesman and Kennedy advisor, Dean Acheson, informed the American Society of International Law in 1963 that no legal issue arises when the U.S. responds to a challenge to its power, position, and prestige, not threat. Uh, he was speaking shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis, which had brought the world uh, to the brink of nuclear war a few months earlier. An important part of the background of the crisis was Kennedy's campaign to bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba. Words of historian and Kennedy advisor uh, Arthur Schlesinger in his biography of Robert Kennedy, who was assigned responsibility for the international terrorist campaign, which escalated further in later years and continues into the late 1990s. Well, turning to the opposite side of the political spectrum, when Washington rejected world court jurisdiction in the Nicaragua case, uh, the State Department legal advisor, Abraham Sofer, explained, quoting him, that most of the world cannot be counted on to share our view and often opposes the United States on important international questions. So we must reserve to ourselves the power to determine how we will act and which acts fall essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of the United States as determined by the United States. 
in this case the international terrorist campaign against Nicaragua, uh, that the court campaigned and ordered halted and was escalated in response. Well, coming back to the liberal end of the spectrum, the Clinton doctrine was that the U.S. will act multilaterally when possible, but unilaterally when necessary, including unilateral use of military power to defend vital interests, such as ensuring uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources. That's without even the pretexts that Bush and Blair devised. Uh, taken literally, the Clinton doctrine is more expansive than Bush's national security strategy, which declared the right to use force to dominate the world and destroy any potential challenge. At least they were talking about potential challenges. It's called preemptive war, but only by radically falsifying the meaning of the term. The Bush national security strategy uh, aroused enormous fear and concern around the world, uh, but then it elicited very harsh criticism at, uh, uh, even at the heart of the foreign policy establishment. The more expansive Clinton doctrine, in contrast, was barely even reported. Uh, the extensive literature on the national security strategy makes the difference quite clear. The objections were on style and manner of presentation and not on substance. Uh, as Clinton's uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright observed in Foreign Affairs, uh, every president has such a doctrine in his back pocket, uh, but it's simply foolish to smash people in the face with it uh, and to implement it in a manner uh, that will infuriate even allies. Uh, Henry Kissinger regarded the Bush doctrine as, in his words, revolutionary, uh, tearing, tearing to shreds the Westphalian system of state sovereignty established in the 17th century and, of course, all subsequent international law. Uh, he approved of the doctrine, but with the standard qualifications about style and manner. And he added a crucial point, which is usually left tacit. Uh, the doctrine, he said, uh, must not be universalized. The right of unilateral use of force, the supreme crime, uh, must be reserved to the United States alone, perhaps delegated to its clients. And as often, Kissinger deserves credit for his honesty and his understanding of intellectual opinion, uh, which indicates no concern for such matters. I'm going to give other examples, but I'll skip them because of the time. Uh, well, continuing with the uh, current consensus, the uh, positions expressed by Acheson, Reagan State Department, uh, Clinton, and the current administration uh, also receive a, an instructive expression in the scholarly literature. These are facts of particular interest in an academic setting, so let me talk about them a little. Uh, there's actually one clear case, the clearest. One of the leading American historians, John Lewis Gaddis of Yale, has just published a book that supports, with qualifications, Bush administration programs, usual provisos about errors of style and tactics. Uh, Gaddis differs from others within the mainstream in that he goes into the relevant historical background, uh, crucially with regard to preemptive war. And we learn a lot from following it closely. Uh, he makes clear, incidentally, that he's misusing the concept preemptive war. Uh, he, in accordance with the current convention, uh, he justifies the misuse on grounds that the constraints that were formalized in the post-war consensus are irrelevant during the nuclear era. That is, ever since contemporary international law was codified to exclude such uh, use of force, condemning it as the supreme crime. Kind of interesting reasoning. Uh, Gaddis traces the uh, uh, Bush doctrine of preemptive war to a famous state paper by one of his intellectual heroes, uh, the great grand strategist John Quincy Adams, uh, who wrote the paper in justification of Andrew Jackson's conquest of Florida in the first Seminole War in 1818. Uh, that war was justified in self-defense, Adams argued, and Gaddis agreed that its motives were legitimate security concerns. In his version, 
After Britain sacked Washington in 1814, U.S. leaders recognized that expansion is the path to security and therefore conquered Florida, a doctrine now expanded to the whole world by Bush, uh, properly, he argues. Uh, Gaddis is a good historian. He cites the right scholarly sources, the primarily historian William Earl Weeks, who's done the most important work on this, uh, but he omits uh, what they say. And we learn a lot about the precedents for current doctrines and the current consensus by looking at what is omitted. So let's go to Weeks, his source. Uh, Weeks describes in lurid detail what, these are all quotes from now on, what Jackson was doing in the exhibition of murder and plunder known as the First Seminole War, which was just another phase in his project of removing or eliminating Native Americans from the Southeast underway long before 1814, which had nothing to do with it. Florida was a problem because it had not yet been incorporated in the expanding American empire, as it was called, frankly, by the founding fathers, and because it was a haven for Indians and runaway slaves fleeing the wrath of Jackson or slavery. There actually was an Indian attack, which Jackson and Adams used as a pretext. U.S. forces had driven a band of Seminoles off their lands, uh, killing several of them and burning their village to the ground, and they retaliated by attacking a, supl a supply boat under military command. Uh, seizing that opportunity, Jackson embarked on a campaign of terror, devastation, and intimidation, destroying villages and sources of food in a calculated effort to inflict starvation on the tribes who sought refuge from his wrath in the swamps. And so matters continued, leading to Adams's highly regarded state paper, uh, which endorsed Jackson's unprovoked aggression to establish in Florida the dominion of this republic upon the odious basis of violence and bloodshed. Now, those are actually the words of the Spanish ambassador, but a painfully precise description, Weeks writes. Adams had consciously distorted, dissembled, and lied about the goals and conduct of American foreign policy to both Congress and the public, Weeks goes on, uh, grossly violating his proclaimed moral principles, implicitly defending Indian removal and slavery. These crimes of Jackson and Adams proved but a prelude to a second war of extermination against the Seminoles in which the remnants either fled to the West to enjoy the same fate later or were killed and for, or forced to take refuge in the dense swamps of Florida. Today, Weeks concludes, the Seminoles survive in the national consciousness as the mascot of Florida State University. Again, a very typical case. Uh, Weeks also stresses the important point that Adams's forceful endorsement of Jackson's crimes shifted the power to make war from Congress to the executive in violation of the Constitution, a principle that remains in force, uh, not troubling uh, strict constructionists. He goes on to point out that uh, Adams's rhetoric also established what he calls the presidential rhetoric of empire designed to marshal public and congressional support for its policies, a durable and essential aspect of American diplomacy inherited and elaborated by successive generations of American statesmen, but fundamentally unchanged over time. Uh, the rhetorical framework, he points out, rests on three pillars the assumption of the unique moral virtue of the United States, the assertion of its mission to redeem the world uh, and to, by spreading its professed ideals and the American way of life, and the faith in the nation's divinely ordained destiny. The theological framework undercuts reasoned debate, uh, reduces policy issues to a choice between good and evil, thus reducing the threat of democracy, the critics can be dismissed as anti-American. It's an interesting concept borrowed from the lexicon of totalitarianism and never used in states with a democratic culture, commonly used here. Uh, the issue of defense against Britain, uh, the only potential enemy, never remotely arose. Uh, the, British, the British minister, Castlereagh, was so eager to cement 
uh, American, Anglo-American relations, that he even overlooked Jackson's murder of two innocent British citizens, which Adams defended for, in his phrase, its salutary efficacy for terror and example. Uh, Adams was uh, heeding the words of Tacitus, his favorite historian, Weeks suggests, that crime once exposed had no refuge but in audacity. Uh, the, uh, the goal of uh, Adams's diplomacy had nothing to do with security, but it did have to do with territorial expansion to the Pacific. Now, that was achieved, uh, although in one sense the British threat was not overcome. Uh, the uh, British military force, forces uh, barred the conquest of Canada and Cuba. Uh, for Cuba, Adams predicted that it would drop into U.S. hands like a ripe fruit by the laws of political gravitation once the U.S. succeeded in subduing the British enemy. And by the end of the century, the laws of political gravitation had shifted, as he predicted, and uh, the United States was able to intervene to bar Cuba's liberation from Spain, uh, turning it into a virtual colony until 1959. Well, filling in the blanks, uh, the picture does support Gaddis's judgments about the precedents for the Bush Doctrine and its implementation. Uh, as for the expansion of the precedent to the entire world, uh, others may judge for themselves, and the world has. As international polls have shown, a fear and often hatred of the United States uh, has risen to unprecedented heights, significantly increasing the threat of terror, as was anticipated, and also the likelihood of ultimate doom. Well, at the margins, we do find more nuanced opinions on the resort to force. Uh, one of the most important is the independent International Independent Commission of Inquiry on the Kosovo War, which was headed by the distinguished South African juror, Justice Richard Goldstone. The commission rendered the harshest criticism of the NATO bombing anywhere near the mainstream, concluding that the bombing was illegal but legitimate. Uh, it, quoting Goldstone, it was illegal because it did not receive approval from the UN Security Council but it was legitimate because all diplomatic avenues had been exhausted and there was no other way to stop the killings and atrocities in Kosovo. Uh, Goldstone concluded that the UN Charter may need revision in the light of the report of the Commission and the judgments on which it's based. The NATO intervention, he says, is too important a precedent for it to be regarded as an aberration. Uh, rather, state sovereignty is being redefined by the fact of globalization and the resolve of the majority of the peoples of the world that human rights have become the business of the international community. Uh, he also stressed the need for objective analysis of human rights abuses. Actually, that last comment is good advice, so let's follow it. Uh, one question that objective analysis might address is whether indeed the majority of the peoples of the world accept the judgments of the self-declared enlightened states. A review of the world press and official statements receive, uh, re, uh, reveals uh, very little support for that conclusion, to put it pretty mildly. Uh, in fact, that difficulty was taken care of by just not reporting it here, but it's easy to discover if you want. Uh, in fact, the bombing of NATO, the bombing of Serbia was bitterly condemned outside the NATO countries, little of it reported here. Uh, furthermore, it's hardly likely that the self-exemption of the enlightened states from the UN Charter and the Nuremberg Principles uh, would gain the approval of much of the world's population. Well, another question that objective analysis might address is whether indeed all diplomatic options had been exhausted in Kosovo. Now, that belief is not easy to sustain. Uh, when NATO decided to bomb, there were actually two diplomatic options on the table, a NATO proposal and a Serbian proposal. The latter was kept from the public here. It still is. Uh, after 78 days of bombing, a compromise was reached between these two proposals, though NATO immediately undermined the agreement it had signed 
and imposed its own solution with the applause of enlightened opinion. Now that too is well documented and I think would be uncontroversial uh, if it were ever discussed at all. A third question, and the most important one, is whether there was no other way to stop the killings and atrocities in Kosovo, as the Independent Commission asserts, clearly a crucial matter. Uh, here, objective analysis happens to be unusually easy. There's a vast documentary record available from impeccable Western sources, uh, several big compilations of the State Department released in justification of the war, uh, detailed records of the uh, OSCE, NATO, the UN, uh, lengthy British parliamentary inquiry and similar sources. They all reach exactly the same conclusion. Uh, the uh, killings and atrocities followed the bombing. If you take a look at the Milosevic indictment, you'll see it's an indictment for crimes after the bombing, one exception. Uh, and as the NATO command had announced at once when the bombing started, and it later confirmed, uh, it was anticipated that the bombing would elicit the crimes that followed it. Well, there's a huge literature on Kosovo, how to deal with this, simply. It ignores the documentation almost entirely, and much of the literature reverses the chronology so that the bombing can be justified as a reaction to the atrocities. So take a highly regarded study of just war called Arguing About War by Michael Walzer, recently appeared. Now he gives various justifications for the bombing, particularly that refugees were already on the move before the bombing. Actually, the UN registered no refugees until a week after the bombing in late March 1999. Uh, his other arguments are of comparable force and others uh, falsify the Western documentation even more severely. I've reviewed that elsewhere and I'll skip it. Uh, while commentators uh, concoct a variety of alleged reasons, they scrupulously ignore the main official reason, which was stressed over and over, namely to establish the credibility of NATO, which does not mean the credibility of Italy and Norway. Uh, the reasoning will be clear to any mafia don uh, and is a persistent feature of what is called diplomacy. Uh, Kosovo was not a pretty place before the NATO bombing. According to Western sources, about 2,000 were killed on all sides in the year prior to the NATO bombing many of them killed by KLA guerrillas, Albanian guerrillas, attacking Serbs from Albania in an effort, as they openly announced, to elicit a harsh Serbian response that could rally Western opinion to their cause. Uh, the British government makes the astonishing claim that until January 1999, most of the 2,000 were killed by the KLA. And Western sources consistently report uh, no significant change from then until uh, the bombing, the NATO war was announced and implemented. Uh, one of the very few serious scholarly sources even to consider these matters estimates that Serbs were responsible for 500 of the 2,000 killed. This is a careful and judicious study by Nicholas Wheeler who supports the NATO bombing on the grounds that there would have been worse atrocities had NATO not bombed. Now, the argument is that by bombing, with the anticipation that it would lead to atrocities, NATO was preventing atrocities. Well, can't disprove it, uh, but that such arguments are taken seriously, as they indeed are, uh, gives no slight insight into Western intellectual culture, uh, particularly when we recall that there were diplomatic options and that the agreement reached after 78 days of bombing uh, was a compromise between them, formally at least. It was immediately undermined by NATO. Well, Kosovo was one of the two great achievements that's been brought forth uh, to give retrospective proof that for the first time in history, states were observing principles and values under the guidance of their Anglo-American tutors. The other example was East Timor. In this case, the principles and values that were exemplified are utterly horrifying. I'm going to skip the matter here because of time constraints, but the record is very clear, crystal clear, uh, 
and we well document it, and we learn a lot about ourselves if we're willing to inspect it. Uh, and if we see how it's been refracted through the ideological prisms. It's quite an instructive exercise. Uh, well, apart from Kosovo, there is one outstanding contemporary illustration of the doctrine that resort to force can be illegal but legitimate, indeed so obviously legitimate that there's virtually no discussion of the matter. I'll end with that. That's Bush's attack on Afghanistan in October 2001. There were indeed some gestures at legality, referring to Security Council resolution, resolutions and to the uh, inherent right of self-defense against armed attack. The resolutions did not authorize the use of force, and there's no way to place the bombing a month later within the rubric of self-defense against armed attack. Uh, furthermore, as the head of the FBI informed the Senate eight months later after the bombing, eight months after the bombing, that's after the most intensive international intelligence investigation of history, uh, the perpetrators were still not known. Uh, he re testified that the FBI believed that the plot had been hatched in Afghanistan, but financed and implemented in Europe uh, and in the United Arab Emirates, all U.S. allies. However, the justice of the attack is considered so transparent uh, that the matter is scarcely even discussed. For Michael Walter, uh, Afghanistan is a triumph of just war theory, standing alongside Kosovo as a just war, uh, no argument necessary, which is just as well, since one will search his book called Arguments About War uh, and we'll search in vain uh, for any proposition of just war theory from which anything follows, unless we add his ubiquitous phrase, I believe. Uh, the opponents of the war, uh, who, according to Walter, were pacifists on American campuses, unidentified. In fact, all of his opponents are unidentified in the arguments about war. Uh, but he uh, regards pacifism as a bad argument on the grounds that he thinks violence is sometimes legitimate. Actually, I happen to agree, uh, but I think is hardly an overwhelming argument. Uh, another standard claim is that the invasion had near unanimous international and domestic support, as the New York Times editors uh, repeated last week, summarizing uh, received opinion fairly accurately the well-known just war theorist, uh, Jean Belka Elstein, writes that only pure pacifists or absolute lunatics question the justice of the war, so therefore there's no need to discuss it. Uh, the pacifists and the lunatics are very easily identified. Uh, there was an international Gallup poll uh, right after the bombing was announced, but before it was carried out, unreported in the United States, uh, the poll found very limited support for the bombing worldwide and almost no support if civilians were targeted as they were from the first moment. And even that tepid support was based on the presupposition that the targets were known to have been responsible for the 11th of September attacks, but they were not, as Washington conceded eight months later. Uh, Afghan opinion is, of course, harder to estimate, but we do know that after several weeks of bombing, leading anti-Taliban figures, including some of those most respected by the United States and current President Karzai, were denouncing the bombing, calling for it to end, and charging the United States with bombing just to show off its muscle, quoting, while undermining their efforts to overthrow the Taliban from within. So the paradigm example is not so simple if we take the trouble to look at the facts, including other facts that suggest a much more severe indictment. Well, few questions are more important today than the propriety of the use of force. Uh, no doubt one can imagine, perhaps even find, genuine cases of humanitarian intervention, but there's always a heavy burden of proof, and the historical record should give us pause. Uh, not only our own record, but that of others. We might recall, for example, the conclusions of uh, 
one of the major scholarly studies of humanitarian intervention in the legal literature. The author finds three examples of humanitarian intervention between the kellogg briand Pact of 1928 and the UN Charter. The three are Japan's invasion of Manchuria and North China, Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, and Hitler's takeover of the Sudetenland. Uh, not, of course, that the author regards these as genuine examples, but that they were depicted as such. Uh, and evidence was provided, which, however grotesque, uh, was regarded with some ambivalence by the United States and Britain, and in fact partially accepted. Uh, well, in fact, the use of force is almost invariably accompanied by professions of benign intent. It's near universal and predictable and therefore entirely uninformative. Uh, inquiry also might unearth genuine cases of intervention uh, that is illegal but legitimate, although the prize example offered leaves this as a rather dubious doctrine and tends to reinforce the measured judgment of the world court in 1949, reaffirmed in the Nicaragua case and others, quote it, the court can only regard the alleged right of intervention as the manifestation of a policy of force such as has in the past given rise to most serious abuses and such as cannot, whatever the defects in international organization, find a place in international law. From the nature of things, intervention would be reserved for the more, most powerful states and might easily lead to perverting the administration of justice itself. Measured words, well worth pondering, I think, at least on the part of those who wish to use the considerable freedom that they enjoy to help avoid the threat of ultimate doom. Thanks. Are there mics out there? Why not? You pick. <laughs> okay, we'll just alternate, okay? Oh, okay, go ahead. Do you think that there's an innate human instinct towards intellectual conformity? Uh, innate instinct, which is fostered by a higher, good higher education? <laughs> Look, it happens, and it happens almost universally. If you look at the whole of universal intellectual history, actually back to the earliest records, uh, the Greek, classical Greece and the Bible, it's uh, overwhelmingly the case that intellectuals tend to be subordinate to power. So that tells us, yeah, there's something in human nature that allows this to happen in particular circumstances. But there's also something in human nature that allows the great majority of the population to reject it. Yeah, human nature allows a lot of things. Uh, it's up to us to decide which ones we want to pursue, develop. Yeah. Uh, Professor Chomsky, I'm from Australia, and I'm very concerned because we have two Australian citizens, David Hicks and another man by the name of Habib, and they are being illegally detained in Guantanamo Bay. David Hicks, in particular, is not a mercenary nor a spy. He was over fighting with America's allies, the Taliban, against the Northern Alliance. Can you comment on how a nation like Australia can free its citizens from that kind of illegal seizure? Well, I'll first read you a paragraph that I skipped because it was getting late. Uh, in that, I, I recalled and I quoted an it, it, the current issue of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is quite interesting because it's a very respectable, sober journal. It's where the strategic analysts uh, uh, warn that we're heading for ultimate doom and hope that China will leave, lead a coalition of peace 
keeping nations to block it because apparently we can't pay attention to it here. Uh, not the lead article in that issue is by a well-known uh, constitutional lawyer, professor of constitutional law, Sanford Le uh, Levinson, and that's worth reading, brief article. He goes through the justifications for torture uh, offered by the legal advisors of the Bush administration. Uh, he points out that they are not so obviously in violation of American law because the U.S. almost never, in fact, maybe never, signs human rights conventions. They are always signed, if at all, and ratified in the ways that I indicated with the reservation. And the UN Convention on Torture was indeed ratified, but only after the definition of torture was rewritten by the Senate and watered down to become what Levinson calls more interrogation friendly. And in fact, he shows that the uh, uh, hideous advice given by the president's lawyers, which has aroused huge protest, is not that far from the reservations indicated in the Senate rewriting of the treaty before signing it. Uh, he also goes on to talk about what you're talking about, uh, the right of the president to simply pick people up in a country that's attacking and says, you have no rights whatsoever. You're an enemy combatant because we're attacking you. And therefore, uh, you're excluded from the Geneva Conventions, which we theoretically sign, uh, and you make up some new legal status. Uh, he says that's part of an exercise of sovereignty. Uh, 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 and here's, this, I'll quote him. It's a view of presidential authority that is all too close to the powers that Carl Schmitt, the leading German philosopher of law during the Nazi period, was willing to accord his own Fuhrer. Well, he doesn't go on beyond that. It's up to the reader to draw the conclusions. Uh, but the conclusions are pretty obvious. Uh, the fact that this is going on is an amazing scandal. And part of it, part of the scandal, and maybe the worst part of it, isn't even being discussed. I mean, what is the United States doing in Guantanamo? Uh, when the US intervened in 1898, which is called here the liberation of Cuba, in fact, to prevent the liberation of Cuba, they were going to liberate themselves. The US didn't want that. It wanted it to fall like a ripe fruit into our hands. So it intervened, prevented the liberation of Cuba, turned it into a virtual colony. I happen to be quoting two Harvard professors. Uh, they, uh, uh, and insisted, you know, forced on Cuba a treaty which Cuba accepted at gunpoint, uh, saying that the, Eastern, the US would keep that end of the island. Okay, uh, there are very limited conditions on that. It's for a coaling station, you know, a couple of other things. But international law and treaties don't mean a thing if the population of the country that has the guns it doesn't enforce them. And the country won't enforce them unless people at least know about them. And they won't know about them unless there's an educational system in which they learn about them. Okay, which means nobody knows anything about this. Uh, so the United States is, in fact, holding that whole area illegally by any, you know, it happens that was before the UN Charter, so you can't say it's in violation of the Charter but, or the Vienna Tr Convention on Treaties and so on, but against any imaginable, you know, principle you can dream up, uh, the U.S. is holding that area primarily uh, in order to prevent Cuba's development. Uh, that's part of the strangulation of Cuba. Uh, is holding that area. And now it's being used uh, as kind of an extraterritorial extra area where, according to the uh, new view of presidential authority drawn from Carl Schmitt, uh, the uh, uh, government's entitled to do whatever it wants. Well, what can people in Australia do about this? Uh, not elect John Howard. That's not the way to do anything about it. Uh, but there's plenty that they can do. I mean, you know, the, the United States is powerful, but can't lack to responsiveness to world opinion. And furthermore, things elsewhere affect public opinion here. And that's where the problem is going to have to be dealt with here, not in China, not in Australia. Um, well, we were going to alternate, I think. Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, um, you seem to be saying over and over again that 
if people knew about the facts, as you say them, uh, things would be different. So how do you su how do you suggest that you know we reform the media, reform education? Well, that's one of the uh, that's one of the uh, opportunities that follows from freedom. Uh, we happen to be unique, unusually free. We have enormous, we're tremendous amount of privilege, tremendous amount of freedom. Almost nobody in the world has anything like it. That means we can do almost just about anything we like. Uh, what's missing is will, not opportunity. I mean, there's no reason why all of these things should be kept secret. I mean, there's no reason why the majority of the population, why each person who I quoted in those polls should think I'm the only person in the country who believes this. Uh, there's endless means available for education, organizing. I mean, we could even imagine democratic elections. You know, it's not such a, I mean, it's not such a uh, idealistic vision. Like, take a look at the second biggest country in the hemisphere. You know, it's not a model to follow, but just take a look at it. Brazil. Uh, they had an election uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the man who was elected is quite an impressive figure. Uh, is a, his background is a peasant uh, worker, union organizer, no higher education. Uh, he was elected over far higher barriers than uh, exist here, very repressive state, you know, tremendous poverty, uh, huge illiteracy, uh, tremendous concentration of capital, the international financial community was going berserk over it. Uh, but he got elected because there were mass popular organizations that don't just show up every four years and say, vote for me, uh, but that are working constantly, uh, locally, you know, regionally, every imaginable kind of issue. Uh, one of them, the Landless Workers Movement, is probably the most important popular organization in the world. Uh, the Workers' Party, all kind of flaws, but it's a big mass participation party that's all, always working. Uh, those are the things that are the basis of a democratic culture. I mean, is it easier for Brazilians to develop this than for us? No, I mean, it's outlandish. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, but that's just, uh, that's just the bare beginning. I'm not suggesting Brazil is an, any kind of an ideal. I mean, if we can't do a lot better than that, uh, that's our, we're, uh, we should look into our own souls and find out why we're not doing it. Certainly we can. Any, any of those means that are used there or that have been used here in the past often uh, are still available, very much available. This question is, do you want to take them? Another question here. Um, Dr. Chomsky, um, I did a paper, and it was about the white paper controversy. Basically, um, uh, most of the documents that was placed in um, for the justification of the war on Iraq was basically uh, photocopied and pasted by an Iraqi college student. And I want to know why in the United States we're so keen on trying to impeach or try um, individuals like Bill Clinton on sexual relations, but we're not uh, even public opinions not considering um, trying or impeaching George Bush because we haven't found um, any weapons of mass destruction yet. So I was wondering what's your take on that? Well, I don't think that's, yeah. Actually, uh, I mean, I, I, lying to the public is not the most serious crime. The most serious crime is the supreme crime of Nuremberg, uh, launching an aggressive war, uh, an evil which encompasses every crime that follows, including torture and a grave and everything else. So, yeah, there were, I mean, in the case you mentioned, you know, you can make some excuses, maybe, you know, didn't read it carefully or something or other. Uh, but uh, resort to violence in international affairs is not a small thing. Uh, that's what the Nazi war criminals were hanged for. Okay? So why uh, do we have impunity for this? And it goes on and on. I mean, I mentioned Henry Kissinger, and I mentioned that he understands the intellectual community. Uh, he knows there's not going to be any objection uh, when he says... Uh, um, we're exempt, uh, we're allowed to use force, but it can't be universalized, meaning only us, no reaction. A couple of, shortly after that, actually a couple of months ago, the New York Times had one of the most amazing articles I've ever seen. Uh, it had, there was an article, I think, around last May, uh, in which uh, they discussed 
some released tapes, there were some tapes between Nixon and Kissinger were released. And uh, in the course of the article, if you look sort of in the middle somewhere, is mentioned the following fact without any particular notice. Uh, at one point, uh, Nixon tells Kissinger uh, he wants uh, uh, Cambodia to be bombed. And Nixon, uh, Kissinger transmits the order uh, with these words, approximately. He says, massive uh, bombing campaign against Cambodia, anything that flies against anything that moves. Okay? Uh, that's a call for genocide. I don't know any counterpart in the archives of any state. Try to find one. Try to find uh, a counterpart in any archival record to someone who says something like, any, uh, whole, bomb the whole country, anything that flies against anything that moves. I mean, right now Milosevic is on trial in, uh, at The Hague, right? Suppose the prosecutors could come up with something like that. I mean, a, a fraction of that uh, about, say, Bosnia or Kosovo. My trial would be over, everybody would be exulting, the great liberal humanists would be patting themselves on the back because they're so marvelous. Uh, he'd be sentenced to successive uh, life sentences. If it was by uh, U.S. standards, he'd be electrocuted. In this case, uh, we have it on record in the New York Times. I couldn't find any response anywhere. I've brought it up in talk after talk here and incidentally in England and continental Europe, no response. Uh, why? Well, you know, because we accept, we internalize the belief that we have a right to carry out genocide. Okay, if that's the case, why debate about uh, Guantanamo? You know, I mean, you know, whatever is, or Abu Ghraib, I mean, whatever's going on there, it's not, it's not a literal call for genocide. And this silence reigns, even though it's known pretty well what the consequences of that order were, but there is no response, okay? That tells us a lot about how we use our freedom, including our academic freedom, and that's a deep problem and one that we ought to be able to deal with. That's the world in which we live.